Welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. We have allowed ourselves to become so disconnected and ignorant about something that is as intimate as the food that we eat. Be prepared to grow your own for victory. God said I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales, yet gentle enough to yean lambs and wean pigs and tend the pink foamed pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadow lark. So God made a farmer. Hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. I'm your host, Harold Thornbro. Glad you're joining me today, and this is episode 116. March 2nd, 2019, and today we're going to talk about heating your home with firewood. I have a guest coming on, uh, Kerry Brown. He's going to share with us, and we're going to discuss the basics of getting started heating your home with firewood. And we would talk about it uh, from the point of view, even if your home doesn't uh, currently have a wood stove. So we'll look into that a little bit about how to get your home set up with one. Uh, Before we jump into all that, though, let's have a few homestead updates I tell you what, the the days are getting longer, so the quail have uh, really started laying eggs more consistently. I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, And you know, we never stopped laying completely, but it definitely slowed down to almost a stop there through the winter. So we're happy to be seeing that pick back up. Uh, Lots of water around here. It rains so much, then we get snow, and then it would freeze, and then it would rain some more, and just water standing everywhere. And lots of water uh, on the property means lots of mud, you know. And uh, when you start walking out in the house uh, and your uh, your spouse says, um, is that mud on your shoes or is that poop? And you're like, I don't know, baby, but it's homesteading. So it's what it is. <laughs> now, there's a lot of mud around. And I know a lot of folks are battling with that. So, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just part of it, you know. Um, our, uh, you know, in the last couple episodes, I've talked about ear mites, uh, in one of my rabbits and that's completely healed up. Now he's looking really good. Just wait, <laughs> the fur is a little slow on growing back up where he scratched a lot of his fur off, but, um, uh, he looks a lot better and, and hopping around and being a lot happier. So I uh, got that taken care of. I'm really glad. And, uh, also I've been really diving into my permaculture reading list here lately and thinking about more application of my homestead. I'm currently reading uh, One Straw Revolution. That's a really good book. There's there's some really great permaculture books out there, and uh, there's just so much to gain. You guys know how I feel about permaculture. It's it's become a really huge part of my homestead. So it's, you know, this downtime when the weather's not been great all winter, and there's not a lot you can do. You can go out and hang out in the greenhouse a little bit or do a little uh, growing indoors, but You know, it's a great time to uh, really break out the reading list and start going through some of them books that you've been wanting to check out. Let's jump into our uh, homesteading in the news section. All right, homesteading in the news. Just tell you about a couple articles that caught my eye. This first one is called Permaculture 101, uh, March 5th at Thompson Free Library. And the reason I bring this up, what this is, is a, is a guy and a, and, a, and a gal that are teaching uh, permaculture, again, at a local library. I Last week, I had an article where there was some uh, some homesteading uh, stuff going on in the library. This is permaculture. And uh, I just thought it was really good. They'll be sharing their knowledge on, on how they've implemented permaculture on their properties and both urban and and rural. I think that's really uh, fascinating. And they're just going to present basic instruction on how to get started and um, interact with the landscape around you and uh, produce food, energy, shelter in a more sustainable way. Again, guys, I, I'm a big fan of permaculture. You know that. And anytime I'm seeing the the news about permaculture being spread around, I'm just always excited about it. And I just want to share that article with you just to show you that it's becoming pretty mainstream. I mean, folks are really starting to buy into the concepts. They're really starting to integrate permaculture into their homesteads, into their properties. And I think it's a good thing. I really, really do. So check that article out. I'll have a link in the show notes for that if you want to go look at that. Uh, but it just might give you an idea on what maybe you could do locally if you're if you're into permaculture or maybe that you could look for something like that in your area. So uh, I think it's really good stuff. The second article I wanted to point out was one called Gardening Can Do What Medicine Only Tries to Mimic for Mental Health. And this was a really uh, interesting article uh, from The Telegraph. And it's and ultimately, it, it, you know, they make the case that how great gardening is for your mental health and how um, 
there's even some studies going on now exploring gardening as a treatment for mental health problems like depression and things like that. I think that's good. I know that uh, I know that when I spend time in the garden, I feel better. You know, I'm a guy who, I, you know, I'll admit, I mean, I get down pretty easy. You know, it's easy to, you know, the weather's bad and, and, and you just, you're kind of bored and you don't, you know, there's not a lot to do outside, especially in the winter time. Uh, getting in my greenhouse can really, really help me. So you might want to check out, uh, that article. It's really good. And, um, you know, and if you, if you feel a little bit down from the winter blues, you know, growing something, I think, uh, there's, there's some, uh, some data behind that showing that it really does a lot for your mental health. And, and now it's being used as treatment in that. So pretty cool article. Interesting. Uh, check that out. Just one more reason to, to grow your own food and get a garden going. Right. Um, let's just jump right into our main topic for today. Today, we're going to talk about heating your home with firewood with guest Carrie Brown. Uh, Carrie is not a professional installer or expert of wood stoves. He's just a homeowner with uh, 10 years experience running a wood stove. He even goes on to say that uh, chimney sweep companies, installers, local fire departments, they may be your best resources for safety questions. But that being said, Carrie is pretty passionate about the benefits of burning wood as a heat source for your home. And I think he has some great advice for us today. So uh, let's just jump right into that interview with uh, with Carrie. I think you're really going to like it if you're at all interested in, um, in heating your home with fire firewood or maybe you're just getting started down that path well carrie welcome to the modern homesteading podcast thanks for having me well it's a pleasure uh now we're here today to talk about uh heating with firewood and wood stoves and uh but before we go down that uh, alley i'd like to know a little bit about you uh like uh, how'd you get how'd you get into homesteading how'd you start uh burning wood and all that and learning a lot about that and just tell us a little bit about yourself uh, I grew up on a on a small kind of hobby size farm, small cattle farm, and so you know, I've always kind of been the outdoorsy type. Always, you know, camping with mom and dad, and mm-hmm. you know, being on the trails and just being outside in, in nature has has always been uh, kind of a family thing. Yeah. And then after a couple of years of um, you know, living in an apartment, after I had my first job and everything, uh, my wife asked me what I wanted for my birthday. And I was like, well, you know, I want a house. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Good so we went looking around and, and we found a, we found an old at around the time about a 100 year old craftsman home and a part of town that was still pretty, uh, pretty economical to live in. And it sits on about a fifth acre. And mostly I wanted the house because I, I wanted my gardens and a little room for some, some animals and things. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's kind of how we how we started and after uh, maybe living here one to two winters i believe and paying that heat bill in an old house that's a little bit drafty i said we're gonna get a wood stove oh yeah big difference uh, than paying them gas bills or electric bills or anything else so however you choose to heat huh yeah and it, it was an electric heat pump and i i think in a, a particularly cold month it was you know 400 plus dollars yeah. and i was like that's just that that just hurts and and, the, and really our power rates here are fairly reasonable overall but still it's you know and where is that exactly what, what area are you in we're we're in we're in knoxville tennessee okay so okay we don't get remarkably cold winters but they're just kind of they're just kind of wet and just um it's kind of floggy really and uh but when we do have those cold snaps that thing was just running constantly and it kind of turns out that it was improperly sized and it would cycle off and on and yeah uh and and then at the at the, at the bottom line was we were still you know we had the thermostat set at you know maybe 62 and we were still cold you know we were still bundled <laughs> up and miserable and it, and it wasn't even worth you know what we were paying so i said right. let's let's look at our all alternatives here yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So, uh, so you had to install a wood stove right from the right from the uh, get go. I mean, it wasn't set up to already put one in. Did you have to do everything? Um, it it was kind of a two stage process. Mm-hmm. I initially um, pulled what I call the carry maneuver, which is instead of spending what I should spend up front, I tried to cut a bunch of corners. Yeah, and I we were basically gifted a very, very inexpensive boxwood style stove that was cast iron, had a lot of cracks and it was really, you know, drafty. Mm-hmm. And we had that put in by a group of people who maybe weren't so reputable. 
And what they did was they just tapped a little uh, 90 degree pipe into mm. the old existing chimney. Yeah. We used that for a season and we realized that it was kind of bad news. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we grew up, I, mean, I grew messy. up with heat, we, you know, wood heat as well. I don't think we had a furnace in any house I lived in growing up until I was probably a teenager. Matter of fact, we, we never, I don't remember ever having a furnace until we, uh, uh, when I was about uh, 15, we moved to Tennessee actually from Indiana down in Cookville area and uh, not too mm-hmm. far from where you're at. And uh, and I think that was the first house we ever had that didn't have a furnace in, or that didn't have a wood stove in it and just had uh, a furnace. So, you know, I mean, we had that too. And I remember that with my dad. We always kind of did things the, the halfway way. Of course, back then, wood stoves weren't near as efficient as they are nowadays. And I imagine you'll probably want to talk right. a bit about that. And, uh, you know, there's just kind of these, uh, basically just a, a metal box you burned wood in <laughs> back then, you know. And uh, sometimes yep. the uh, setups for uh, rigging them up uh, were a little sketchy. And you know what? A whole lot more houses burned down back then, I think, for wood stoves than they do nowadays, too. No joke. Yeah, yeah. So we'll so, talk a little bit about it. How do you determine, uh, okay, now wood heat is, I mean, how did you decide that that was right for your house or anybody would decide that? Um, you're, one of the biggest factors you got to look at first is do you have actual – room as far as clearances for the stove itself so if you're looking at a freestanding stove not an insert that goes into an existing fireplace yeah. you're going to want to be able to clear three feet all the way around that mm-hmm. maybe mm-hmm. not the back a lot of them are heat shielded on the back like ours is but it butts up to um the the mantle which is all brick yeah but as far as any kind of combustibles three feet so um make sure you can fit it um yeah. and then it, you know, it helps if your house is more insulated. We had added more insulation at that point, particularly in the crawl space. But, you know, it, it, it's just like anything. If you have a real drafty house, it's still going to pull a draft. You're still going to feel, you know, cold breezes. But mostly, I think, when it comes to, you know, making a decision on whether or not you want to go with wood heat, I think you have to be willing to accept some inconvenience. That's your trade off. Mm-hmm. You're going to save a lot of money, but you're going to spend some time, you know, just kind of managing it. It's a much more hands-on process, obviously, right. than just, you know, adjusting your thermostat. Sure. Yeah. So there are some, yeah, there are some things you have to consider, and you know, the clearance is definitely being one of them. But the thing I remember, you know, we don't we don't have a wood stove in our house anymore. I have one in my uh, garage, but I don't have one in the house. Uh, our house just isn't even wasn't ever built with one, and it would be, you know, it's it'd be a pretty big in, endeavor to to put one in our house. But uh, one of the things I surely remember about it being in a house is the uh, the the dust and the mess and the, the the film that landed on things, and that's something you have to deal with with a wood stove, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I just I just have to wipe stuff off, you know, mm-hmm. about once a week. I mean, I could definitely do it more often, but the bare minimum is once yeah, a week. Yeah, it does. That's, you know, when it comes, comes to cleaning there. the ash out, sure. yep, that's just part of it. Yeah. If you're somebody who's got a lot of respiratory issues, it might not be for you. You know, if you've mm-hmm. got COPD and asthma really bad, you may, you might want to reconsider that. Or it, it's definitely a greater expense, but it will eventually pay itself off if you use, like, an outdoor wood burner or boiler that gets piped in. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's pretty popular around here. You're getting into a few thousand here. dollars, but... Yeah. Yeah, but a lot of people have them, so they, they probably do pay for themselves eventually. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but are those things like, uh, can you use those things in cities and, and towns and stuff? Because I've heard that you can't from some people because the pipes are so low that the smoke kind of travels low um, when you're in a more town-like situation or a lot of, around a lot of houses and stuff. Do you know if that's those outdoor ones? I Probably, I'd say you'd have to look at your local ordinances. Yeah, probably. Um, We don't really have anything like that here as far as, I mean, I don't see very many of them, but we also don't, I think you see them, like I said, up in your area where it's Mm -hmm. colder, longer. Yeah, yeah. Here, you know, an an indoor wood stove will get you, can get you pretty warm, almost too warm a lot of the time. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) I just, uh, around here you see them, but I never, I've never seen one hooked to a house in town. I always see tons of houses, you know, out in the country and stuff have them, but they do look like a great way to go. I mean, you from what I understand, they just go out a couple times a day, you know, morning and evening and stock that thing up, and it pretty much keeps things going. They run their uh, water heaters and everything off of them. Yeah, when we have more property and we, we really want to build our own place out on some more land, you know, within, you know, a decade or so, I'm I'm probably going to be looking at one of those mm-hmm. just for the mess factor, you yeah, know, yeah. anything, and the efficiency. Right. I mean, yeah, it's a little <laughs> bit of inconvenience going outside to stock them up, but, boy, I think it makes up for it on the other end for sure. Right, right. Now, I know there's some homes that definitely shouldn't have a wood stove. I mean, you'd say, you know, probably shouldn't do it if you're in this situation. Is there anything like that? 
Yeah, generally not in mobile homes. Mm -hmm. Um, I know there are some models. I know Englander makes some models that, um, that it does say on their website, you know, you can use this inside a mobile home. It's got all the shielding and everything on it. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons I think not just the, because mobile homes are, have to be combustibles in them, but the, uh, thing, you need, it needs to be able to bear the weight of the thing. I mean, ours weighs yeah. a little over, I think it's about 350 pounds. It takes the two of us to move it. It yeah. took, you know, four guys to bring it inside. So, um, you, you got to make sure that floor is going to hold up. I actually ended up going up underneath our house and, checking for any sign that anything had leaned or you know had kind of sunk a little bit and yeah. actually built in a little extra brick pillar it was it was probably overkill but that ended up you know just being it just made me feel better to do it so make sure it can bear the weight because once you're you know you're talking a fully loaded stove you might be looking at over 400 pounds just yeah. sitting there year after year after year so 350 pounds yeah, for, a, for an empty stove huh? wow but getting that in the house is fun <laughs> yeah yeah it's they're they're sturdy the one we have now um i mentioned the the cheap one that we started out with we did one season with the with the cheap um you know danger master 500 stove and uh when we pulled that one out we bought the uh it's the nc13 version which is a smaller version of the um I want to say it's England. England Wood Stove Works is the name of the manufacturer. They're mm-hmm. real popular. They're they're your more economical brand, but they're still really well made. And it is a it is a high efficiency um, stove that it doesn't have a catalytic converter in it. It's still it's got a baffle plate on top of the baffles, so it kind of like reburns the uh, the smoke that's pulled up through the baffles. It it burns through a second time, so the smoke that comes out of your chimney is. Um, if you can even see it, it's, you know, it's practically clear. You're not going to see yeah. any big black city smoke. So it is a much cleaner stove and it's Way very more efficient um, too, I would think. Yeah. By far. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's, it's like the difference between throwing a, a log on your outdoor, you know, fire pit versus just, you know, having a closed in, well sealed and gasketed oven. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine so, that, uh, those, um, don't put off it because they're so sealed up and because they're doing such a fine job of burning everything up. They're probably a lot cleaner too. Would you say, uh, I mean in the house even they are. And a lot of them come with, um, a, a pan in the bottom. They'll collect the ash and you can kind of, you, you pull out one of your bricks out of the bottom. There's like a little plug basically. And you can scoop the ash into that hole and it collects in the pan. And then you can just take the whole pan out. So you're not shoveling ash out into a bucket and you know kicking up that dust spreading that all over the house um Mm -hmm. if the ash pan is a little small so if you're able to do it you know every couple of days it's it's big enough for that if you go longer then you're kind of scooping it you're just doing multiple trips either way but it is cleaner as far as um keeping that ash from spreading around is this a is this stove you're talking about is that is it cast iron steel or what what is it exactly it's uh, it's plate steel plate steel okay but you can get Mm -hmm. i mean they still make the cast iron uh, all the other types of, of stoves uh, yeah right. yeah i see them at the roll king stores and places they, yeah. they do still make them cast iron is usually the cheapest but they also mm-hmm. wear out the fastest i anticipate yeah. this stove being a multi-generational sure. appliance you know yeah 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 well what's your thoughts on fireplace inserts um i've i grew up with one in my grandmother's home um they're great they can they can really push the heat out but it requires having that electric blower so if your power mm-hmm. goes out you know, it, it acts just more of just kind of like a, a vaguely, you know, ambient heater, which, yeah. you know, everybody's, you know, 10 feet off of it to feel any benefit at all. But when, you know, <laughs> otherwise, when that, when that blower's going, you know, you can heat the entire, in this case, it, it really heated the entire first floor of a rancher style home. Mm. So, yeah. But, um, you know, the blowers are pretty important on, on a regular uh, freestanding wood stove as well, though, aren't they? Yeah. And most models come with the option yeah. to be able to put one on. We could put one on ours if we wanted to. Um, yeah. but ba- the area we're heating is barely 900 square feet, so we don't really need it. Right. You know, it, yeah. it heats the two main rooms and then the kitchen south facing, so that stays warm. And then the bedroom's the coolest room in the house, but that's kind of how we prefer it anyhow. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know, but who wants to go to bed in a 75 degree bedroom? So, yeah. So it's, it certainly covers the basis on that. So do you, now you, said you paid some uh, sketchy uh, folks to hook up your first one. Now, did you pay somebody to hook up your second one, or do you recommend that? Yes. That okay. time around, I I did my research, and 
um, you know, wasn't afraid to drop the amo- appropriate amount of coin to get it done correctly. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have to worry about it. So yeah, we ended up paying about $800, which we recouped that on the first season. $800 was the cost of the stove and the installation. And that was, you know, so that you've got your single wall pipe that goes up to the ceiling and goes through a collar, at which point it's like triple shielded where it passes through the ceiling and then into the attic and then through the roof. Mm-hmm. And I remember, you know, the, after they had it installed, I just, you know, I was very confident the company had a really good reputation. They've been in our area for, you know, 50 years. And the first time I lit the stove and had it going really good, um, because I was so paranoid about this, you know, chimney going through my roof. <laughs> right. Uh, I got up in the attic and, you know, was putting my hand on, you know, the outer part, the shielded chimney, yeah. and it was just barely warm yeah that, that and triple I had the wall is pretty cranking. amazing it's amazing and they were like so when i was growing up it was you know all single wall, wall stuff and you could definitely feel it and you had to have a brick yeah. chimney pretty much back then but uh, yeah that triple wall i've i've been around a little bit of that. that's pretty amazing stuff how it can really hold that heat in yeah so they just they did a fantastic job i recommend them to the local people all the time you buy somebody's looking at doing one i said they did it right they did it in a day um, everything stayed sealed. There's been one time I've had to get on the roof with some, uh, flex seal and like spray in just a little corner of the flange where it had, it was, I think it was more of just like a foundation issue where the house had moved a little bit and it mm-hmm. just caused like this, this little tiny leak and that took care of that. So I'm, and I want to say we're on year, I guess we're on year eight or nine of having this stove. Oh, wow. So it's yeah. Just, yeah. It definitely paid for itself for cool. sure. Oh, yeah. Now, I don't know if I misheard you or not. When you said $800, what did that include? That was the stove and the install. It, that it, that was even the stove. We, yeah, that included the and, stove. And all the pipe? We ended up getting one. Yep, all wow. the pipe and their labor and all that. Um, I had it done in the off season. Yeah. So I got a deal where they didn't have as much work. And the stove we got, it was kind of like a factory second. It had a couple little dings. A little place on the back was bent. It was yeah. just, you know, aesthetics. Yeah, that's I wasn't a, worried about it. I'm you know, really so. surprised it was that. Now, <laughs> a, a stove the size of one you bought, like how many? Is it have a recommendation for square feet and things like that? Or yeah, the NC13 is recommended, I believe, for about twelve to fifteen hundred square feet mm. max, and that would be pushing it. Like I said, the inside of our yeah. house we're looking at about nine hundred fifty square. feet. I mean, with some blowers and, and things, you could definitely it probably require that. Yeah. But yeah, de- I mean, I could see that. Wow, I'm a little and bit blown know, away by that price. <laughs> I was too. I was too. I it, you know, be a lot more than that. And I'm sure, like you know, people's results may vary on that. that yeah. was, you know, like say, if you can get stuff in the off season, that's mm-hmm. that's when you can get your deals. Yeah, yeah. So do you? So you wouldn't recommend anybody install one themselves for them usually? I mean, I I grew up in a house where we didn't pay nobody for nothing. I mean, we did everything ourselves. But what are your thoughts on somebody doing it themselves? I mean, if they're already a builder. Yeah. And they're confident with the use of tools. If they're confident cutting a mm-hmm. hole in their roof and all that kind of stuff, yeah. you could. And you could, yeah. I mean, especially in these days of YouTube and all the, the Internet articles, you sure. could assemble. The, the pipe assembly is not complicated. Yeah. Um, and I, it, it was, I mean, it was a little more than I was willing to take on, but mostly it, just because the roof was so steep and, and could, I didn't really want to be up there. Right, and, you know. right. It could probably have some uh, – insurance consequences as well though maybe on with your insurance company you know versus you installing that having or having somebody else install it that's licensed for that sort yeah of thing. yeah yeah they wanted to know when we we did call our insurance about it um to make sure we, we weren't gonna, like accidentally you know void our homeowner's insurance yeah, or something right. just having a wood stove at all and the interesting thing was they said well it doesn't void it as long as you have another form of heat were, you know, working in their house. Well, we still oh. had the heat pump, even though we had pretty much quit using it because it was just so expensive. That's interesting. Um, we would only use it if we were going to have to be away for a couple of nights in, you know, January or February. So, but that was, you know, that was our carrier. That was State Farm. So, again, people's mileage may vary on that, depending right. on who the carrier is and how strict yeah, they are. Yeah. But there is a lot to there's a lot to consider. I mean, the clearances you mentioned earlier, the the weight for the floor, um, the, just the, the 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 shielding around the pipes and things like that. There's a lot to consider uh, when you're installing one. If you don't know what you're doing, it's definitely recommended. I think it's it's smart to say you know get somebody to do that if you're just unsure about any part of it. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's definitely. Uh, I feel like probably above and beyond the DIY approach for most people, especially yeah. when it comes to like 
when it comes to finishing out your chimney, mm-hmm. you have to know it has to be so many feet above the lowest point and the peak and the distance from the – you, you got to throw some geometry in there at some point, and that's not in the strong yeah. suit. Because if you yeah. don't get that at the appropriate height, you're not going to get the kind of draw you need, and you're right. essentially going to have an almost useless stove. There, there's a lot to consider. Now, do you have bins in, in your installation? Is there a, like a 90 in there anywhere, or does it go straight up? It goes straight up. There's a little where they had the position (laughs) in it. Yeah, there's like a little, um, I'm not really sure what to call it. It It's it's hardly a bend at all, but they had to make put this little collar on to kind of tilt it just a little bit to one side just because of the way the stove is positioned. Mm -hmm. I think they were trying to clear like a beam going up through. And, but yeah, I mean, if you, the straighter you can get it, the better. That's yep, when you're going to yep. get your best draw and your best control. Yeah. Well, I've seen a lot of, uh, and, and you know, even growing up, like I said, we put in a few wood stoves in some houses we had. And I remember we'd have a couple nineties in there, you know, sometimes yeah. going out of wall and up <laughs> and it was like, yeah, but you just made it work and, and, but it's not mm-hmm. best. Yeah. I mean, the, the reality is a straight pipe is, is best for sure. Yeah. It makes it so much easier to clean and maintain when you have, you know, no bins to, to contend with. So what about going through the roof? I mean, uh, what was required there? There's just kind of a, a flange it passes up through where they, they mm. when they, you know, repair the hole and they put the shingles back over it so it would continue to shed water. Yeah. Um, right. And then they just capped it with like a, uh, it's a spark arrestor style yeah. cap. Okay. So what What is that exactly? It's um, people you would, most people would recognize them. It's just kind of a, it's almost like a, flying saucer looking thing Mm -hmm. on the top of the chimney and should anything make its way up the pipe that's still flaming Mm -hmm. it'll capture that and just kind of knock it back down and let it burn off again so you don't have hot embers essentially lining up so basically the smoke has to come up and then kind of turn and go under that and then back up but Mm -hmm. if there's anything heavier in there it'll just kind of hit it and drop back down as it cools yeah 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 Right. Um, and that's where it's I tell you what, that, that yeah. single white wall and shielded pipe you were talking about, like the triple wall or even double wall pipes and stuff. It's when you're starting to go through, you know, uh, uh, ceilings and roofs and things like that. It's so important to know about that and, and understand what you're dealing with there. Yeah. This is not a thing you cut corners with. Right. You know, it's is, expensive. It's not though. a weekend project. I think that's why I was so surprised at how cheap you said you got the stove in for and insulation and all, because I know that, uh, like, the triple wall pipe and stuff is some pretty high-dollar stuff. Yeah. I, like I said, I don't really remember how they got me such a good price. I think yeah. the stove itself is 300 so everything else is around yeah. five. But Yeah, yeah. You know, just, they, that's worth they it took good care them, of us. That's worth it to have them carry that thing through your door because that <laughs> and have to yeah. do that yourself yeah. doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's let's talk about the the operation of a wood stove. You know, getting wood, you know, uh, cutting wood or buying wood or whatever you have to do and that kind of stuff, and 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 just kind of go down that road a little bit. All right. So <clears throat> selecting and obtaining your wood is is pretty much that's that's going to be the biggest battle because this is what will make or break the usefulness of the stove. Mm-hmm. So initially, you know, we would, we would, we were buying from wherever we could find wood. And, and there's a lot of people in our area who do firewood. So it wasn't hard to come by. What was hard to come by was consistency and frankly, honesty about what you were actually getting. Yeah. Um, we went through a lot of people where they're like, Oh, it's seasoned. Well, mm-hmm. then we found out this stove really wants, you know, wood that is, you know, sat in, has been cut and sat somewhere in the wet for six months might look seasoned, but the stove's not going to burn it. Mm, so yeah. we learned that, you know, it, the, the wood did need to be really, really dry. We eventually found, um, a man who exclusively runs a firewood operation. He doesn't do anything else. So he devotes his full time to it. And he actually has this giant kiln and a conveyor belt and everything. And he splits everything, runs the, the splits through this uh this kiln and gets it down to like something mm. crazy like five percent moisture like just wow. you could almost light the stuff with a match it's so dry <laughs> um but but it but he but he sold really good quality wood it was it was all hardwood so for folks who don't know you know learn the differences between hardwoods and you know your your softwoods your your pines and your mm-hmm. your evergreens or your softwoods and then your you know your deciduous trees or your hardwoods yeah, you yeah. can people will say that you can't burn pine. Well, you can. Yeah. The difference is it needs to be really dry and it's going to burn fast. You're not going to mm-hmm. get as much out of it. 
but they're an excellent way to start a fire or to run. A lot of people will use them to run just little short hot fires to knock the chill mm-hmm. off when you don't need a fire all day long. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll collect any wood now. So, um, we learned after, after about two years of kind of changing out firewood suppliers and the, the gentleman I spoke of with the really good quality wood was, um, very consistent and he was wonderful. Our only issue was, I mean, he, he it cost a premium. It, it still cost me about $350 for a mm. full cord, which was certainly, you know, it was worth it. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, but yeah. you know, me being me, I hate to spend money. Um, I was like, I'm just going to start, you know, I'm going to, let me see if I can supplement first and then let's see if I can eventually build up enough of a, uh, of a supply to where we don't have to purchase wood anymore. So, yeah. Now you see the word and, cord uh, out there. You want to define that for, for listeners that don't know. Yeah. What that is. Yeah. This is important because in a lot of places, there's a, ver- a variety of terms. Mm-hmm. People will say they're selling a rick of wood. A rick really isn't a technical term. I don't even know mm-hmm. what that means. Some people that means that's a pickup bed works and that's also yeah. really arbitrary. Yeah. So a quarter of wood is four foot as it is wood stacked four foot high, four foot wide and eight feet long. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's, that's a, a, a technical measurement for, for lack of a better word. That means that's what you're getting. Yeah. Um, instead of, you know, people sell stuff by the truckload. Well, I mean, are you, are you bringing in an S 10 or are you bringing, you know, a long bed? With, you know, <laughs> you know right, it's, it's right. $50 no matter what. So and just to get some perspective, yeah, no, no how long, getting. how, how long, how many cords of wood do you go through in a winter in your area? Most of the time I can get by on a little over one quart of wood. Okay. Um, and, and what, is, and what did you say a cord yeah. cost? This, this gentleman was selling them for, it was 300 to 350, depending on when you ordered okay. it. Um, of course, the closer to, you know, wood burning season it gets, the, the more expensive sure, it, you know, it sure. becomes as demand goes up. Um, there's been just, times we've been more like a cord and a half. It just depends on how cold it is. And it, it would probably depend on the type of wood, how hard the wood is. I mean, some woods are yeah. just, you know, burn longer and, and better and, you know, I mm-hmm. mean, you, you know, and things like that. But th- that just gives some perspective. I was just trying to get some perspective on like, okay, what would it cost to get enough wood? you know, for the average person to burn for a, for a winter. Mm-hmm. And, and it would probably depend on the stove. And like I said, it's going to depend on the wood. I mean, there's going to be variables in that. No, no doubt about yeah. it. But I was just trying to get a kind of a rough idea of what you were doing there. So, yeah, we, um, we eventually were able to gather our own wood. I haven't had to buy wood in several years mm-hmm. and really, I mean, remarkably, I, I find most of it for free. I'll find, you know, I'll keep an eye on the free sections of Craigslist and mm-hmm. Facebook yeah. and stuff like that. And when people's trees come down, a lot of times, you know, we're in the city, so the city will go and they'll, you know, cut and leave stuff on the curb. Yeah. And people will post it up, you know, free wood. So for the most part, I find my wood just for just for the time and labor it takes me, you know. I, I, I do I the pay. exact same thing. I got a wood stove yeah. in my garage. And, I, you know, it's if, just to heat my garage occasionally. I don't really want to go out and you know, do too much or spend a bunch of money. So, but yeah, I do. I see that on Craigslist and even and Facebook marketplace and places like that. And you'll see people, I, you know, I, we cut down a tree and now have it cut into logs and you just have to come and load the logs up and you bring it home and split it or whatever. And I get that. I've got that a mm-hmm. few times. Yeah. That's, and that's really the way to go. In fact, there are enough people around mm-hmm. here doing it that, you know, me and some other fellow have pulled up, you know, to the wood pile at the same time. And we're like, well, can we, you know, can we split it? <laughs> yeah. We- yeah. Can we each take a little bit because we we've spent our time coming out here. So, sure. yeah, firewood does not last long around here. It's I think a lot of people are are kind of making that switch. So you go out and find wood that's been freshly cut, uh, and and you bring it home. What's the process after that? What do you do to get it ready to burn in your stove? So I'll start with um, I'll go ahead and cut it into log size. So mm-hmm. I, I try to aim for about 16 inch long logs. That way I can stack it fairly neatly. Um, I just stack it on my driveway. I've got a long driveway that runs from the road all the way back to our garage. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's paved and it, and it's, you know, a few inches higher than, than the yard. So it's more or less, you know, getting, I'm getting it up off the ground. It's yeah, not I get some drainage there. The yeah. yeah. And I'll just kind of, I'll, I'll stack that up. And then as they, and I pretty much just let everything sit there over the summer. I don't, unless, unless I'm collecting it and just cutting it to size. I don't even mess with it over the summer because it's too hot and too miserable. So as soon as it starts to cool off, I'll get out there um, with, I 
Uh, nowadays, I use a mong. I learned how to split mm-hmm. with a splitting mong. I have used um, like a a foot pump style split. I've used a you know really inexpensive electric hydraulic splitter. Mm-hmm. Um, but I found that you know if you if you're able and you can learn to split by hand, it's faster than any of those. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it heats you and, twice, uh, right? <laughs> it that is accurate. That is really really <laughs> accurate. So yeah, when it's more pleasant and you know kind of late September. I just go out there and I'll spend, you know, about an hour or two and I'll get a bunch of stuff split and I'll, then I go ahead and I've got room in my garage, a stack in my garage where it'll stay dry. And I've got just enough room in that garage to fit about two cords in there. Mm. So I try to always have that cord kind of in reserve that I get that I rotate back in. Yeah. Okay. Do you have some, uh, do you have some favorite woods that you like to burn the most or split and handle and just get like, you see them pop up on Craigslist or something. You're like, Oh yeah, I've been going after that. You got something, a favorite, uh, any of the, I mean, any of the oaks are really, mm-hmm. uh, you know, they're, you're going to get your most, you know, your BTUs out of those. Yeah. Um, I'm not real picky about wood ties. I'll, I'll collect anything. I'll try to collect like too much pine just cause I don't want to take up too much room of, and you know, in place of other wood. But I'll I'll go for anything. But I'll tell you my least favorite <laughs> that I've discovered okay. that I will actually avoid at all costs is uh, it, um, there's a lot of sweet gum trees around here, yeah. and a lot of them get to the age where they're dying. A lot they'll live about fifty years, and then they, they fall over and people cut them up. <laughs> oh my gosh, I don't know what it is about these trees, but they have like a um, their grain is is spiral. It doesn't like. Huh split out like a spider web it's yeah it's like you put this spot and it does not split with anything i have tried i have hit it with the sharpest heaviest maul i could muster and the maul bounced off and went flying into the neighbor's yard wow and i i took that log and i called it a bad name and i threw it out in the chicken yard <laughs> for the chickens to sit on so and that was like that? five years ago and that log's yeah. still out there it won't yeah. die it's <laughs> you know it's just there so yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, that, that, that's a no-go. But, yeah, anything else, free wood, you know. I yeah, tell my yeah. wife when I see a sign for free wood, I'm like, that's just somebody telling me, like, they're just going to hand me cash money because that's how I look at it, you know. <laughs> yeah. Is there is there some, like, uh, recommendations for burning or getting some wood started and, and burning them, you know, that may be different depending on the wood? Or, I mean, I guess all the same as far as getting it going. But uh, what would you be your suggestions there be? Um, I, I've just, I've gotten it real simple at this point. I will just pick up, um, you know, small fallen limbs wherever, uh-huh. you know, along, along the roadways and then, you know, where people pile them up at the edge of their yards and stuff and I'll go pick them up for them and just, you know, dry just sticks off the maple trees and stuff and some newspaper mm-hmm. starts a better fire in that little stove than anything. I've never had to use anything fancy fire starter log or anything right. like that. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's the most agreeable stove. It's really great. Um, it's a lot mom and dad just keep a stove going. I'll go out there for it. <laughs> yeah. I was sorry, I was going to say, mom and dad, you know, they, they tease me because I'll go out, they've got a big old maple tree in their front yard, and every time I go out there, I take my kindling bucket and pick up all the sticks out of their yard <laughs> and take them back home because I'm like, it's the best kindling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, just getting one started. But like, we, we, we try to keep them going just, you know, all the time pretty much. And, and you know, you, you get a nice little bed of coals or whatever, and it's just so much easier to get one going. You keep that thing pretty hot, and it just goes mm-hmm. a lot easier than trying to start a cold, you know, fire every time, just getting one started from scratch. Yeah, that's a good point because that was that was part of our learning curve was how much of a coal bed do I maintain mm-hmm. versus, you know, letting it die down completely and then restarting it. Yeah. And because, uh, you know, there were times I would let the cold bed get too, you know, too high, basically. Yeah. And then you've got the air wide open trying to burn those coals back down. And, you know, and it's not really operating at peak efficiency. So there's definitely, a, you know, there were a couple of seasons worth of learning the, the quirks of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like you got it down to a science now, and you pretty experienced with it. And you're, you're uh, in your opinion, you probably wouldn't, wouldn't want to heat your home any other way, would you? <laughs> No, no, I would. I mean, wherever we, you know, live in the future, it's, you know, wood heat in one form or another is going to be an absolute must. Yeah. I just, I can't imagine without it, even though it, there is, you know, it, uh, uh, there is the, the, the trade off of some inconvenience and, mm-hmm. you know, having, having to plan ahead and whatnot. It's still, you know, we have what we call the, the, the caddo meter when it's, you know, time to feed the stove or not. And that's, uh, 
will look at the cats. And if the cats are, you know, about four or five <laughs> feet back off the stove, it's fine. I don't even need to check the thermometer on it. It's fine. But if the cat is, you know, within about six inches of the base of the stove, it's, it's time to throw on a log. <laughs> <laughs> no log on the fire. The cat's getting too close yeah. to it. Yeah, there yep. you go. I think folks' biggest concern with wood stove, I mean, of course, it's it's a labor aspect of it. But, you know, homesteaders mostly don't care about that. I mean, they're, you know, we're... They're a working type of people, and they, it's not that. I think the biggest issue people have with wood stoves is their safety concerns. So yes. let's talk about that for a minute. Is, is wood is burning with wood safe? And what do I need to think about? I really about feel like I'm, it is. Yeah. Yeah. If you have had have if you have had it properly installed, mm-hmm. if you have your fire extinguisher handy, your smoke and your CO um, carbon monoxide alarms, um, have all those in place. That's that's a must. Um, yeah, I mean, I got to the point where I was afraid to leave it burning if we were going to be away, if we were going to go out to dinner or something. And now, as long as I know that it's in a state of burn where it's not going to get hotter, it's only going to cool, mm-hmm. I have no trouble at all leaving the house, just shutting the air all the way down and leaving the house and knowing that it'll be warm when we come back and, you know, I'll have some coals and I can kind of get it started again. Yeah. Um, the one big, um, safety concern and this was actually I, I just it didn't happen to me but it was a it was an um there's somebody's post i read on the hearth.com forums which is a really really good resource if you want to throw that in the show notes those those folks on those forums are just wonderfully nice and helpful um somebody's teenage boy took a, a pizza box a really empty pizza box and tossed it on top of a bed of hot coals and, you know, of course, it burned really hot, really fast, and a whole bunch of uh, basically, you know, giant pizza box embers went mm-hmm. up and kind of ignited some of the soot that was in the, in, mm-hmm. in the, in the stovepipe. And it didn't it, – it, the fire that happened in the chimney was contained. It didn't spread to the house, and it burned itself out. But the, the gentleman who posted it said it was, it was the most, you know, terrifying thing when, you know, having a chimney fire. Yeah. I've uh, seen a chimney fire. <laughs> I've, I've had one. <laughs> we have one at my mom and dad's and it, yeah. it's nothing to joke about. It's an, it's very, um, aggressive sounding for sure when it happens. <laughs> it's a rumble, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You get this, like surging enough, rumble. It's like crazy. It. Yeah. It. uh, mm-hmm. It's very, yeah, it actually scares you. It makes you nervous and you, and you feel kind of helpless and there's not a whole lot you can do other than just kind of wait for it to go out. <laughs> yeah, know. like, yeah, go outside and you see if any sign of your roof being on fire and right. otherwise you're, yeah. I mean, I mean, it, certainly, you know, you know, call for the fire department just, just in case. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I've, I've had one time where I, I, I got sidetracked and I left the air open mm-hmm. and, it got too hot. It did not catch the chimney on fire, but the, the stove itself had gotten so hot that I just had to stand there and just watch it. And I just yeah. felt like, you know, if, if you're a scatterbrain person, be disciplined. Like, don't yeah. don't start something and walk away. And I'm scatterbrained. I'll try to do too many things at one time. Mm-hmm. And it took that one time of it getting too hot and scaring me that I was like, I'm not going to do that again, you know. A lot of the... Besides that, a lot of the danger with with uh, wood stoves and especially fireplaces, or you get this open door or open front end where where uh, you know things fly out uh, and and can yeah. you know cause some problems. So you know that's could be an issue too. I think with safety, so you want to keep things closed up as best as you can. Yeah, and if you're going to use a fireplace, you know, use your screens. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I would treat a fireplace just like your, uh, you know. It, like you just decide to have a fire pit in the middle of your living room. Yeah, yeah. The same thing. You got an open fire there. Um, yeah, you want to cover it up. But yeah, even just leaving a door open on a wood stove is pretty can be pretty dangerous. So certainly, certainly, and, and sometimes I'll have I'll have to do that with the roof. I have to prop it open for a little bit to get enough of a draw. Like yeah, when we have these kind right. of cooler days where the you know the barometric pressure is low, I have to leave that door open and really let it catch. And uh, that's when you see the, you can tell because you can see the smoke coming from the chimney. It just it just sinks. Right. It doesn't go up. It just sinks towards your house. And mm-hmm. you're like, ah, it's going to be hard to get a fire going today. Well, that's something, you know? yeah, something good to look at. Uh, yeah, I mean, just, just keeping, you know, keeping an eye on things, I think, is the biggest thing. You know, when you're going to have your door open, just watch it and make sure nothing's uh, crazy, uh, you know. Um, Check, basic maintenance, looking for things. What are some things maybe you'd want to check occasionally and just go around and look at to make sure things are in, in good working order? You have a list of right. things so like this that? Is what I, yeah, this is what I like to do every um, – I'll, I'll do it when I shut the stove down in the spring, and then I'll do it again uh, in the fall before we start it up again just to be kind of extra safe. 
And the safest stove is one where you can control the air, which means any of the air gaps, like where the the pipe fits into the top of the stove or the back, wherever it goes in, Mm -hmm. make sure that's tight. There's um, cement that you can get from Ace and any place like that where you can just kind of pipe it in around and and you can just kind of, I just take an old butter knife and just spread it in. You can fill all those cracks. Yeah. Um, I redo that every year. Um, uh, make sure your gaskets are tight. I'm still on my same set of gaskets. It just kind of depends on the wear and tear, but yeah, you can, you can glue your gaskets back in or replace them all together. So the, the best way you can keep your stove safe is to keep it as airtight as possible and then just clean your chimney. Um, you know, if it's, if it's a pain to butt for you to clean, just hire somebody out to do it. They'll run a really stiff wire ruster there and any mm-hmm. creosote that's collected, you can just get knocked out. That's the stuff that ignites the chimney fire in the first place. So right. if you don't have that stuff in there, your chances of a chimney fire are, are you know, pretty sure. minimal. And I've seen some uh, pictures like going around Facebook and stuff of pipes that were almost completely closed up with creosote and just build up. What causes that exactly? Is it not burning that's, wood that isn't seasoned? Yeah, it's it's two things. It's wood that's not seasoned, and it's letting your fire burn too cold. Mm, it's really okay. safer to run. That's why it's important to get your get your little thermometer that sticks on your chimney pipe like mm-hmm. a uh, with a magnet, and that gives you your range. And yeah. when you're in the white, that's your efficient range. That way, you know you're not just kind of smoldering this fire. Some people are afraid to get their fires too hot, especially when they're new to it. They think mm-hmm. it, you know, too hot is dangerous. It's actually the off. Well, too hot is too dangerous, but yeah, right. too cold is, you know, that's what causes that creosote. It basically is, is when the all the byproducts of the wood are not burning off, mm-hmm. and they just stick to the inside of the pipe. Okay. And yeah, okay. I've seen I've seen some, you know, some really really clogged up pipes. Mom and dads can get that way because it, you know, it's an older chimney and it's yeah. It's just kind of, it's not lined. It's hard to clean. And dad and I'll mm-hmm. get up there and just kind of wail on it from the top and knock all that stuff down. <laughs> yeah, it can be really dangerous. And uh, that's why you have to stay on top of that. And I think after one cleaning, you can know how much, you know, after you clean it, twice, especially, you know if your chimney's kind of prone to a lot of buildup or not too bad. I mean, I've seen, we, we used to clean our chimney occasionally. And, you know, it, and I remember it, we just never had an issue. Of course, we always burned probably hotter than we should have you know it was we never yeah. had an issue with it when yeah. but back then you know like i said the wood stoves were just different they weren't as efficient they they didn't burn as proper as they do now so you just stocked them up and try to get your house as hot as possible and then you just open your windows and doors to cool back down <laughs> yep yep the good old days i remember those days yep. yeah yeah yep. i grew up with one of those big earth stoves the, the yeah. big monstrous beast of an earth stove and yeah. and, and you could get it hot but you would, you know, you, it'd be January and you'd be in your shorts and t-shirt because it was 85 degrees in the <laughs> yeah, kitchen. You have to step outside of the front, your front uh-huh. porch and cool down a little bit every once in a while because it's so hot in your house. Yeah. I mean, you can do that yeah. and, and that, but you don't have to do that, especially with today's stoves. They're a lot, you know, they just work a lot better. You don't have to go that hot and get things that crazy out of control to, you can get a better balance yeah. to your house for sure. Um, yeah. so you, you've been burning wood for a while now. Uh, what, what's some basic maintenance on a wood stove and, and, and things you'd have to do occasionally? Uh, so yeah, I mentioned the, um, taking care of your, your connections and stuff with the cement. Mm-hmm. Um, on, on our case, the, uh, the, it does get a little bit of surface rust on the, on the plate steel stoves. You can just take a little bit of like fine grit sandpaper and just kind of sand that off. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll wipe it off really well. And then there's just stove paint. There's just black, flat yeah. stove stove paint. And you can put that on there. You can put it on the pipe. You can, you know, you can sand the rust off the pipe if you just want to stiffy everything up really well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, it's one of those things. That stuff doesn't, I don't think, I don't feel like it affects the operation of the stove too much. But for the sake of aesthetics, you know, that's what I, that's what I'll do. Sure, sure. And beyond that, I mean, that's really it. Um, you might need to occasionally replace the baffle plate on top. It depends on the model you've got. Mm-hmm. It's this kind of ceramic style plate that sits on top of the baffles. And ours ended up um, cracking in half mm-hmm. after. I don't know, several years, and it had kind of gotten worn down. They will sort of eventually deteriorate. I think I got about six years out of it, though. I went over to the store where we bought the stove and got a replacement, and and I took the old one to show him, you know, and he was like, no, it looks about right. That's about, you know, the the lifespan of them, and he said, even if it's split in half, you can still use it. It'll still, you know, it'll still work fine, but I was just like, "Eh, I'm just going to go ahead and, you know, do all the maintenance today, and um, the, uh, 
you know, depending on the model, of course, go with go with whatever the manufacturer recommends. Mm -hmm. But the three baffle tubes in the top, I'll take them out. They're just they're seated in there with like a little drywall screw, and you can take them out, and they'll collect some ash. You can tap the ash out, kind of brush them out, yeah. and it'll, it'll run a little better. These are just little things. It's, you know, you can you can be really really thorough. You can be less thorough. Um, this is one thing I kind of feel like something that's it's burning a fire in my home. I'm going to take pretty good care of it. Sure. You know? Yeah. Yeah. What about your pipes and things? I mean, is there any uh, maintenance you can do with those or things you got to look for, ways to check those? I will use a mirror. I'll take the baffle plate out and the baffle tube. So it's just that I can just directly access the pipe and take a little handheld mirror and a flashlight. And it takes a little mm -hmm. bit of kind of, you know, wrangling. But once you find it, I can see all the way to the top. And if I see, shiny stuff that's when i know i've got a little bit of creosote oh, okay. i rarely see any but um but i can just kind of i can see one time a bird's nest got built in there over the oh. summertime so i had to you know knock that down yeah, um yeah. That's good and tip. uh yeah they'll 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 get they'll get in there on occasion usually in the summer we'll get one bird that'll come down in there and we'll see him you know the cats will let us know hey there's a bird in the stove and we have to you know catch the bird and let it out but <laughs> yeah make sure yeah make sure they've not built a nest in there because i if you're having trouble getting a draw on your first uh, first fire yeah. of the season, that's probably one. Yeah, um, yeah that's good. Too. So chimney swifts, they'll they'll build. This is like a little sparrow's nest, but I've seen chimney swift nests, and they will build nests that are they're really heavy and dense. It's not this little kind of wispy nest you'll see in a tree. These things, I don't really know what they do, but it's almost like a bunch of sticks like cemented together. They're they're really robust nests, so they'll they'll block the pipe for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll be building up some uh, some smoke in your house there real fast, wouldn't you? Yeah, and uh, you can get you a, a chimney brush. There, um, just get one to fit you know the size of your pipe. They are the when I I learned this that the the wires on those brushes are really really stiff, and I ended up barely being able to get this brush up through mine um because I, I clean everything from the bottom i don't want to get on the roof mm -hmm. um it makes a little more mess in the house but my roof is really steep and it's like 15 feet to the ground and you know it, yeah, oh it's yeah. gonna hurt so you. yeah so we do it inside we make a mess inside and we just clean it up but uh the brushes are designed to fit very very snugly in the pipe so that it it, it does a good job of cleaning so be prepared to have to use some muscle and you know if it's if it's you know out of out of out of out of your abilities and just you know hire somebody out or you know yeah. hire hire your neighborhood kid it it doesn't take a skilled person to do it it just takes some coordination and just a lot of oomph really yeah yeah my if if you even want to do it yourself you might hire that hire that neighborhood kid to come clean up the mess when you're done if nothing else <laughs> exactly you know i mean sometimes you know it's just a good way to you know I, i'll throw 30 bucks at somebody to you know save me a little bit of hassle sure 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 now one thing i remember uh, about wood stoves is, is and, and it's pretty much common knowledge is that it's a really dry heat um, and in a lot of ways it's not ideal in your house i mean i remember uh, sitting on the couch and getting me a nice shock every once in a while or something like that you know just because just the humidity mm -hmm. uh, changes from a wood stove any suggestions for that yeah um humidifiers are going are gonna to be your best mm -hmm. friend yeah. Um, another thing you can do is if you've got, you know, like a working, um, heat pump, you can turn the heat pump off. You can turn just the air circuit, just the fan essentially just on, which is what we'll do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of moves everything around a lot better. And, um, yeah, we'll run, we'll usually run like a, a humidifier or a vaporizer, you know, kind of in the, just, in our sitting area. In there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we'll run one in the bedroom too, which is, you know, we were, um, having a problem with a couple of nosebleeds and we talked yeah. to the doc and he was like, you guys need, you guys need more moisture, especially at night yeah. when you're, yeah. you know, when you're in there. So yeah, you just kind of have to, you, you do just have to kind of judge the way you feel that the layout of your house, how the heat moves around the house. Uh -huh. um, and you'll, you know, you'll, you'll figure out where you, where you need a little more moisture. I wish like we do so much cooking and, and, and you know, we use a steamer a lot in the kitchen I wish there was a way to like move all that moisture from the kitchen to the rest of the house because it'll feel like the kitchen is drenched and the rest of the house is bone dry. But, yeah, yeah, you get some fans, move it around, circulate that a little bit. I huh? know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Wow. Well, it sounds like uh, that uh, wood heat has definitely uh, treated you well, and uh, it saved you a lot of money over the years. And um, yeah, I mean, totally. is it, you just recommend it for a lot of situations, obviously. So um, it sounds like that uh, you've got a lot of things figured out on it. But we do want to clarify, you're not a professional at any of this. I mean, you're just a guy who loves burning wood and then realizes the benefits of it, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm just a homeowner that's gone through you know some of the learning curve. Yeah, and yeah. I just wanted to pass along a little bit of what I what I had learned. It it sounds like a lot. And it sounds a little bit intimidating, but yeah. um, you know, get on the the hearth dot com forums and just read what those folks have to say. They're really helpful. And then ultimately, um, if if you have any questions at all, talk to your professional installers. And a lot of areas too, you can um, you can call your local fire departments, whether you're you know in a city or a county or have a volunteer service, whoever you've got. Um, a lot of those guys will work part time doing installs and doing inspections. Mm-hmm. They'll come out and they'll look at your chimney. They'll tell you if your chimney looks safe, if you've got missing bricks, if it can be lined, if it, you know, if you need to just go with, you know, a, a fresh install and bypass your chimney altogether. Those guys can be a really good resource too. Well, Kerry, I sure do appreciate you coming on and uh, and talking to us about this. I think it's something that a lot of homesteaders or even aspiring homesteaders want to know more about. Uh, and it's definitely a, a a way to be more frugal in a lot of ways. And, uh, okay. you know, there's there's a there's a lot of folks that have environmental concerns and things like that. But you know what? To me, I think, the bit, you know, there's a lot more environmental concerns on the way we acquire other uh, you know, fuels and things to heat our homes personally. So I don't think it's as big a deal as a lot of people would say. Cause I know there's a, I've heard a lot of environmental issues with these, but these to, it, wood stoves today are, today are just so efficient that I think that uh, a lot of those concerns are dying. Yeah. I, I, I with wood being a renewable resource and, mm-hmm. you know, I know if I'm able to source quite a bit of my wood through stuff that was either came down through natural causes or it basically was a tree that was going to be cut anyhow you know i'm still kind of i'm still making a use of that resource without doing further damage um it's certainly better than you know we're we're out here and unfortunately you know coal burning country so i'm okay with using less electricity and a little more wood absolutely absolutely well i sure do appreciate you coming in and coming on and uh sharing your your knowledge with us and uh, i think some folks are going to get something out of this i think you, you gave us a lot of great tips and a lot of great information and i'm sure some some a few folks are really going to benefit from it so i really appreciate it i was happy to come on i appreciate your time Oh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll talk to you. Well, you're a member of our Homestead Forum membership community, so we'll be seeing you in there if nowhere else. <laughs> yes, I will I will make an effort to pop in more often. That's, that's become an excellent resource. Well, thank you for uh, for being part of that and for listening to the podcast and now coming on the podcast and, uh, and contributing. I really appreciate it. You're quite welcome. All right, great interview with Kerry. Thank you so much, man, for coming on and and chatting with me about wood stoves. I really enjoyed it. I think the uh, listeners will too. I will put in the resource section in the show notes the forum he mentions at uh, hearth.com. I went and checked that forum out. There is a there is a ton of great information there and I'll put a link to that in the show notes if you're wanting to know more or have questions. Well, let's just jump right into our homestead recipe of the week. <laughs> This week's recipe comes in from Megan on Instagram as AntiMeg2005, and she's going to be giving us a recipe for a quiche that can be made from the overabundance of our homesteads. Hello, small town homestead. Um, My name is Megan, and uh, I just listened to your most recent podcast on um, family homesteading where you requested that we send in our favorite homestead recipes and share it with everybody. So I wanted to do that because I thought it was a really cool idea. Um, I'm a a passionate gardener. (laughs) I don't by any means have a large farm. We live on a half acre, and I have um, a relatively small garden, but we end up growing so much in it that we have an abundance of of stuff every summer that I'm able to preserve a lot of it and we benefit from it all year long. And um, so I was wanting to share my recipe that I use a lot with our family. I have three kids. They're not super picky eaters, but they like what they like. And so I have made um, a basically 
get rid of whatever you have an abundance of in your homestead before it goes bad quiche. So um, I have experimented with making my own cheese before, had chickens um, in the past. And so you always end up having like lots of eggs left over, lots of vegetables. So basically what you do is you take a preheat your oven to 375. You uh, mix up about a dozen of your farm fresh eggs. Um, You butter a nice large glass pie plate. And then uh, to your dozen eggs, you add a couple of tablespoons of flour because that makes the eggs nice and fluffy. You add about a quarter cup of milk. You add a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. But my magic ingredient is dried dill because it just adds this new level of flavor to the eggs and it's just so good. <laughs> and so um, so then you can proceed to use any vegetable from your garden that you wanna that you wanna use uh, quickly. So if you have broccoli, you know, we steam it a little bit, we chop it up real fine, we put it in the bottom of a pie plate. Um, I would say about, you can do a cup and a half to two cups of steamed broccoli. Um, you can do spinach, you can do fresh green beans, you just throw them in there, fresh asparagus. Um, I've used cherry tomatoes because we always have an abundance of those. And so I just throw in some quartered cherry tomatoes on top of that. Um, as I mentioned before, I have experimented with making my own cheese. So I've made like cheddar and mozzarella. You just sprinkle some of that on there. Um, any kind of cheese, it's cheese, it's delicious, it'll work great. And then you throw it in the oven at 375 until it gets brown um, on top, just a little bit of golden brownness on top. Um, and that takes about a half hour, but then I turn the oven off and sometimes the middle can kind of stay a little wet. So I'll cut a slit in the middle and then just pop it into the, the warm oven and let it finish, finish cooking all the way through. And then we just slice it up and we eat it. And I'm telling you, the kids gobble it up and we eat it for breakfast, lunch, dinner. It's good for leftovers. You wouldn't believe how good these eggs are after you just, you know, warm them up a little bit um, the next day. So it's a really good, simple meal. It's healthy and you it helps reduce waste <laughs> from your garden. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to share that with you and uh, I'm really enjoying your podcast. So keep keep it up because I'm learning a lot. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Thanks, Megan, for sending that in. I really appreciate it. Great stuff. Uh, if you want to send in your favorite homestead recipe, uh, you can just send in an audio recording of whatever it is that you have, that you, something you love to cook, something that you feel like is a great uh, recipe off your homestead. You know, we generally like it to be, uh, you know, something, you know, maybe the main ingredients be something you can grow or, or something that, uh, that you can get your hands on real easy. Um, you know, we're not really looking for, uh, you know, five-star dishes that uh, you need to go out and buy a bunch of specialty ingredients for. But, you know, what if it has a few specialty ingredients? That's okay, too. Whatever you like. What's something great that you prepare on your homestead? If you want to do that, uh, one of the easiest ways to do that is with a cell phone. You can just uh, grab your cell phone. They, most of them usually have a recording app installed on them. And then you can just uh, record your recipe, uh, try to make it between one and five minutes. It doesn't have to be perfect. You can just say, you know, this is so-and-so. And if you have something you want to promote, like a Facebook page or a, a website or something, that's fine too. And just say, you know, a recipe I like to share with you today is, and then get after it. Uh, when you're done recording, you're satisfied with how it sounds, just email it to me at sdhomestead at gmail.com. And I'll add it to a future episode. And we'd love to have your recipes. Really would. It's just I think it's a great segment for the show. And we need more recipes. So I appreciate anybody that does that. And uh, you know we're we're trying to we're trying to get some variety in our kitchen. You know we're trying to find some new ways to prepare things and enjoy the food that we're that we're raising, that we're foraging for. You know that we're hunting and fishing for. And um, you know this is a great way for y'all to contribute to the uh, the podcast. And it's something I need help with, you know. I mean, we cook a lot of the same stuff over and over and over. So we're always looking for great recipes. So if you have something that you want to contribute, that would be great. All right, this week's listener question. Uh, this this week's question comes in from Rachel. And uh, she asks, 
And she actually asked this on Instagram. I had posted a picture on Instagram of uh, it's a little stainless steel can that we use to collect uh, our food scraps. And it's got like a charcoal filter in the top of it. And, you know, it's it's pretty handy little thing. I love it. You know, we just fill that thing up and about once, maybe twice a week, we'll take it out and put it in the compost bin. Uh, our scraps. And it's just a good way to collect the scraps. You don't feel like, you know, going out to the compost bin after every meal. So we can collect them in that. It doesn't put off any odor. It seals it up. Like I said, it's got the charcoal filter and stuff in it. Stainless steel, so it washes real easy. And I really like it. And when I posted that, she asked me, what do you do with the kitchen scraps you collect for compost in winter? Now, a little background is she's in Michigan. And she says she can't even begin to get to her compost pile because of all the snow, right? So, you know, I, I just, you know, here's my answer. Uh, I told her I'd answer it on the podcast because I thought it was a, you know, it's something a lot of people wonder about. What do I do in the wintertime? Now, you absolutely can keep a compost pile going in the wintertime. There's a lot of tricks to it, to keeping it hot and cooking and, and, and producing good compost for you all winter. I don't necessarily do that. You're asking what I do. Here's what I do. When the snow isn't piled isn't you know piled up really high on on the on the compost pile i always keep a pretty good heavy layer of leaves just kind of surrounding the compost pile on top of the compost pile and then i will just go back and kind of dig those leaves out of the center and put those scraps right in there and then push the leaves back over it now this doesn't get a hot compost i'm not turning it every once in a while i'll turn it i'll rake the leaves off kind of flip it around push the leaves back over it and that will produce a little bit of heat um and I've even seen it steaming, so I know it puts off a little bit of heat, but I don't really try all that hard to do it. But if you do that, you can get it under and bury it. It will generate a little bit of heat. It will do a little bit of cooking, and I just do that on my compost pile. Now, I also have a vermicompost pile. It's actually, I have underneath all, all my rabbit cages, I have that boxed in, and all their droppings uh, drop down into there, and there's a ton of worms in there. I've just I've built a, compo- a vermicompost system underneath their pins, and their cages and um, all that drops in there. So I'll throw a lot of food scraps and stuff in there occasionally. And the worms love that. So that kind of keeps it going there. And listen, nothing happens real quick in the winter around my homestead either. I'm in Indiana. You're in Michigan. I don't try to do it. I mean, I don't try to keep it really going strong in the winter time. All I'm really trying to do is just keep that stuff going out of my kitchen, not in the trash can, not down the garbage disposal, but out into the compost. And, you know, as soon as it starts warming up, that stuff will start cooking really good. I'll start turning it and it won't take long at all. Just a few weeks and we'll have some really good compost. And I always got compost left from the year before. So I'm not always trying to keep the thing going, you know, full blast, full production all the time. I just want it to generate enough heat to kind of slowly uh, get it to turn to compost. And it does that. It, it does. I mean, I went back out there right now and I raked the leaves back. I mean, that stuff's already starting to break down. It really does uh, turn to compost even slowly, uh, no matter if you turn it or not. So that's what I do. I don't go all out on it. Uh, and you ask what I did, and that's what I do. I mean, there's a lot of people who do it a lot better than me. But my main goal is just to not waste it and get it out there and just get it to where at some point it, it's usable compost. So that's my answer for that. And I, like I said, I know a lot of people do it better than me, but that's what I do. If you want to submit a question for the podcast, you can send your questions to ask at smalltownhomestead.com, or you can call or text in your questions to our voicemail at 765-203-1949. Submit as many questions as you want. I'll try to get to one a week on the podcast. I really appreciate you guys sending those in and, um, hope, Rachel, I hope that uh, gives you some ideas on maybe what you can do. I, I, like I said, I'm not doing anything real fancy, but that's how we do it. I know up in Michigan, you got a lot more snow right now than we do. So, yeah, getting to that compost pile can be a little tough. But, you know, try to try to arrange a spot or get a pathway to it or find a place where you can kind of pile that stuff up until you start turning it into really good compost. So, there you have it. Guys, I really appreciate you listening to this podcast. I really appreciate those who join our Homestead Forum membership community. You can learn more about the benefits of membership by clicking become a member there at smalltownhomestead.com. And we also appreciate those of you who use our Amazon affiliate link that, you know, that, that adds up, that helps out a lot and it doesn't cost you any extra. So it's a great way to, to support the podcast. And, um, you know, we really appreciate it when you share this podcast with others, when you, when you leave reviews at iTunes or at our website or anywhere that where you can leave a review or you listen to your podcast, 
And we really appreciate the companies and individuals who partner with us for advertising, sponsorship, and support through our membership. Uh, really appreciate that. So if you help out in any of those ways or want to, uh, check that out. Really, really, uh, really appreciate that. The show notes for this episode can be found at smalltownhomestead.com forward slash 116. And remember, in the words of uh, Teddy Roosevelt, it's far better to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to take rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much because they live in the gray twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. Get out there, guys. Try something great. Do something great. Do something. You know, there's going to be failures. There's going to be successes. And in the end, you know, you're going to be a lot better for it. And uh, you're going to be living a much better life for you and, and, and for those around you. And you're going to leave a better legacy. So get out there and do something great. Thanks for joining me today. And uh, until next week, happy homesteading and God bless. Thanks for listening. To see the show notes for this podcast or listen to other podcast episodes, go to smalltownhomestead.com. There you can also read our blog, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, and take advantage of the many resources we make available to help you along in your homesteading journey. Please share this podcast and help us to carry out our mission of helping others to homestead today for a better tomorrow. Thank you.